you know that it was time to start? <laughs> Glad you guys are finally ready. I've been out in the lobby waiting on you. Gosh. Good morning. Welcome to Broadway. We're so glad that you are here, and welcome as well to those joining us on the live stream. We're so glad we can worship together. So uh, as you know, during this time, we're just working our way through the book of 2 Peter. Now I'm going to read a, a passage out of uh, chapter 2, uh, starting in verse 12 through the end of the chapter that's talking about false prophets and false teachers. Here's what Peter says. But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, Born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction, suffering wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children. Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. These are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit, and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. Let's pray together. Father, again, we are grateful for the opportunity to gather together as your people to worship together. And we... We hear your warning in 2 Peter 2 against false prophets, against false teachers, and what makes them false. They're false because they don't line up with the truth of your word. So we gather today standing upon the foundation of the truth found in the scriptures. So as we sing that truth together, as we preach that truth, as we celebrate that truth, we acknowledge that it's from you. It is what is our foundation. So would you inhabit our praises, as your word says? Would you open up our eyes to the truth found in Scripture today? And thank you for the opportunity to worship you. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Hey, Broadway family, great to see you this morning, even though I can't really see you. You can see me, and that's, that's pretty awesome. Anyway, I'm coming to you from our family vacation, and I know you're not buying this. No, this is not really where we are, so I'll drop that charade right now. See, that's a lot more believable, isn't it? Anyway, I thought I'd better say a few words to you this morning so that you're not halfway through the worship service going, hey, that... That guy at the piano isn't, I mean, he's bald too, but that's, great. that's not me. That's my good friend, Dr. Nathan Soyce. He serves as the associate pastor at Atlanta Christian Church in Atlanta, Illinois, and he has graciously agreed to come and lead worship while I am not there today. So please make him feel welcome, stand in worship, and I will see you next week. Let's stand and worship God together and give him praise that he deserves today.
said, amen. Let's continue our worship.
like to take a second and um, welcome you, whether you are here with us this morning or if you're joining us online, um, welcome and thank you for choosing to worship with us this morning. Uh, we like to take this, take a second every week to um, say that we would love to connect with you um, this week and if this is your first time here, we just want to um, say um, welcome to you, especially if um, we have any kids that are going back into our children's program and if you would like to uh, meet Miss Jody back in the back. Um, she will take you back to the kids' area. Um, whether this is your first time here or if you've um, been uh, a regular attender, um, we would love for you to fill out our digital connect card. Um, that is a way that we can connect with you throughout this week, that we could be praying for you this week. We would love to be doing that throughout this week. Um, if you, this is your first time here, you can access that a digital connect card on our website at broadwaycc.org backslash worship. And you can fill that out there. If you have uh, been here before, someone in your family sometime today will be getting a text with that link. Um, we would love for you to fill this out so that we can interact with you throughout this week. Um, before we get um, going um, with, uh, along with our service, um, let's take a second and pray. God, we thank you for um, this opportunity that we have to this morning to worship you, to praise you. Um, God, we just ask that you bless the rest of this service, um, bless this message that we're about to hear. Um, God, we, we praise you and give you all the glory in your son's name. Amen. Hi, everybody. Grab a Bible, open it up to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew 7. There is an ancient religious story that goes something like this. There was a father who had two sons. One of those sons ran off in rebellion and wasted his father's inheritance. But while he was away, he came to his senses, recognized the error of his ways, and came back home and was welcomed home by his father. Sound familiar? Well, it's not the story that you're thinking of. The story that I'm talking about is an ancient Buddhist story. And those of you who are somewhat familiar with the Bible would recognize that Jesus told a story almost identical to that one. So some similarities in sacred writings have led some people to conclude that all of the world's religions are basically the same. In fact, 64% of Americans believe that all of the faiths of the world worship the same God. Our prevailing culture views faith Issues of religion, kind of like a buffet. When, when you go to a buffet, there are a bunch of options. None of them really are more important or better than the other ones. I mean, who are you to say that fried chicken is better than roast beef? Even though it is, who are you to declare such a narrow thing? I mean, there are any number of ways for you to approach a buffet just because as there are any number of ways for you to approach faith or religion. There are some people, when they go to a buffet, they go straight to the vegetables. We call them terrorists. <laughs> they go to the salad bar first and only. And here's why. It makes them feel better. To think, I can go to the feed trough, I mean the buffet, and I can... I can get away with it by having only salad or only vegetables. There are people who view religion that way. It's called works-based religion. 
They do good things. They do moral things because it makes them feel better. So whether it's keeping dietary restrictions or focusing on a prayer wheel or making a pilgrimage or just trying to be a good person, it makes us feel like we're becoming a better person. Bill Maher, the TV host, after seeing the movie The Passion of the Christ years ago, said this on his show, the thought of someone else cleansing me of my sins is ridiculous. I don't need someone else to cleanse me. I can cleanse myself. There are others when they approach a buffet They bypass all of the salad. They bypass all the vegetables. They bypass everything. They go straight for the dessert. We like these people. They're bold. They're risk-taking kinds of people. And why not? All the ways of approaching a buffet are fine. Well, this is how some people view religion. It's called hedonism. That my faith is all about everything that brings me pleasure. It brings me good things, everything that I can do that I'd like, and it's, it's okay to do that because all of the options are valid. So if you want to go straight to the ice cream machine, stick your hand underneath it and pull the lever, be my guest because no one can tell you that you're wrong. If you want to get your piece of fried chicken and dip it in the chocolate fountain, go ahead. No one can say that's not a valid option because all options are equal. But for most people, when they go to a buffet, they do a sampling. They take a little bit of most things. They get to choose what they want, how much of it they want, and they can discard the things that they don't want. You create for yourself a customized meal just for you. This is the dominant way that people in our culture view faith. It's called pluralism. I can look at all the face of the world and I can pull the pieces out of it that I like. I can discard the pieces of them I don't like. And I can customize for myself my own personal faith. Actress Sarah Michelle Gellar said, I consider myself a spiritual person. I believe in an idea of God, although it's my own personal ideal. I find most religions interesting and I've been to every kind of denomination, Catholic, Christian, Jewish, Buddhist, I've taken bits from everything and customized it. You see, in our culture, Christianity is perceived just to be one option among many. And to say that it is the only right choice, to say that it is the only right option, seems downright arrogant. It seems exclusive. I mean, who are you to say that one option at a buffet is the only right option So much so that even Christians, those who claim to place their faith in Jesus Christ, they seem to agree. Half of the Christian population in America believe that you can be saved through any of the world's religions. Hindu, Muslim, Buddhist, Jewish, doesn't matter as long as you are genuine, as long as you are sincere in your worship in that religion, God will save you out of that religion. Seems as though most Christians would agree with a man named Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, who's a Hindu leader. Here's what he wrote. One can ascend to the top of a house by means of a ladder or a bamboo or a staircase or a rope. So too, diverse are the ways of approaching God, and each religion in the world shows one of the ways. While that may seem like a reasonable view, and it certainly is a popular view, here's the problem with it. Jesus disagrees with it. So when we get to Matthew 7, Jesus gets right up in our face and he tells us how salvation works. Look at verse 13. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad and its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow and the road is difficult and only a few ever find it. So there's a narrow gate. Found only by a few, there is one path, there is one way. And there's a part of many people, even those who claim to be Christians, that bristle against this. They hate the idea of this, so they try to backpedal away from it. They try to water it down. They try to explain it away. And I think people do that because they misunderstand the real problem between them and God. 
And see, back in the book of Genesis, at the very beginning, we discover that God created all things, including humanity. And everything was just as he wanted it to be, just as his perfect will declared it would be, and, and his will was done. It was unhindered by sin. God places Adam and Eve, our original parents, in a perfect garden called Eden, and there he gives them one command. Do not eat from this tree. You can, you can have all the other trees. You can eat from any of them that you want, but not this tree, because if you do, you will die. In perfect paradise, there is one path to death, and they chose it. They sin against God in their rebellion. Sin now enters the picture and destroys everything. It separates humanity from the God who made them. It destroys their relationships. It, it, it ruins paradise. And the rest of the story of human history after Genesis 3 is the account of, of humans trying to restore a now broken relationship with God. So the Old Testament comes along and the law is introduced and the sacrificial system is introduced. And now we believe if we could, if we could just do the right things, if we could just offer the right kind of sacrifices, we can get God back again. He will love us if we do these things. But here's the problem. It's never enough. Whenever you've offered the right sacrifices, you sin again. Anytime you do something that you think is especially noteworthy and good and moral, you only discover on the back end that maybe your motivations weren't as pure as you thought you were and it wasn't as good as you thought it was. No amount of goodness has ever been enough to alleviate your guilt. Isn't that your experience? No matter what we do, no matter how good we might be, we think we're great, we think we might be good enough to be accepted by God, but deep down we understand nothing I've done has yet to make me confident in my relationship with God. We want to be good people. We want to go to heaven. But we simply can't pull it off. We can't cover the guilt. We can't take away the shame. And intuitively, we know this is true. This is why the vast majority of people on the earth are profoundly religious of some kind. Because they understand they can't do it on their own. They need outside help from someone from somewhere. We can't fix our problem. And the Bible affirms that very clearly. Romans chapter 3, verse 10. As the scriptures say, no one is righteous, not even one. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. All have turned away. All have become useless. No one does good, not a single one. Their talk is foul like the stench from an open grave. Their tongues are filled with lies. Snake venom drips from their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. They rush to commit murder. Destruction and misery always follow them. They don't know where to find peace. They have no fear of God at all. That is the universal indictment from God across the human race. And there is no wiggle room or flexibility in it. It is for everyone. We can't be good enough. We can't clean up our own mess. We can't do it ourselves. So if sin is going to be dealt with, someone outside of us is going to have to deal with it. So when Jesus starts off, Matthew 7, verse 13, with these five incredible words, you can enter God's kingdom. Aren't those great words? You can enter God's kingdom. You can be a part of this. Even though Romans 3 is true about you, you can enter God's kingdom. So when we hear those words, we ought not be offended that there's only one way to do that. We ought to marvel at the fact that there's a way at all. The gate, the road there is narrow. Well, how narrow is it? Well, it's about the width of a cross. Let me explain what I mean by that. Two truths for us to know. Number one, the cross is the means of salvation. The cross is the means of salvation. If sin's going to be dealt with, somebody else has to deal with it. Somebody else has to pay the penalty. The penalty is death, eternal separation from God. And the good news of Christianity, the gospel, is that Jesus paid your penalty at the cross when he died for your sins. That's good news. Romans 3, verse 23. 
for everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard, yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. Romans 5.18. Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone, but Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone. Colossians 1, verse 20. And through him, through Jesus, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you. Isn't that a great statement? This includes you, who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now, he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. And as a result, he's brought you into his own presence, and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. That is what differentiates Christianity from every other religion in the world. This is what makes Jesus unique from all of the other founders of world religions. All of them tell us, you need to do better. You need to obey better. You need to do more. And if you do, God or the gods will love you. They will accept you. But Jesus steps onto the scene and says, you can't do that. You never could, and you'll never be able to. It is impossible we can't save ourselves, so instead he saves us. Titus chapter 3, verse 4. But when God our Savior revealed his kindness and love, he saved us. Not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ our Savior. Because of his grace, He made us right in his sight and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. So this narrow road, this narrow gate of salvation is defined by the cross because that is the only way God has saved you. And if we try any other way, it will lead to death. And isn't that what Jesus said? The highway to hell is broad. That that, that gate's wide. There are an infinite number of ways for you to go to hell. There is one way for you to enter into eternal life. Truth number two. The cross is the mark of salvation. The cross is the means of salvation. It's how it gets done. The cross is the mark of salvation. So this road is narrow because it's not just the gates that's narrow. The road itself after the gate is narrow. It's narrow not just because the cross is what has saved us, but because the cross is what defines those who've been saved. The cross is what is carried by those that have been saved. Matthew 10, verse 38, if you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you're not worthy of being mine. If you cling to your life, you'll lose it, but if you give up your life for me, you will find it. So we're called to deny self, to pick up our cross, a a dying to our own kingdom, so that we can enter into his. Friends, you can't enter into God's kingdom if you're still trying to be king over yours. You can't follow Jesus if you're constantly chasing after what it is that you want. And this is what the Sermon on the Mount is all about. We've walked our way through it for the last number of months. Next week is is the end one. We're, We're done with it after next Sunday. The Sermon on the Mount is about God's kingdom people living life in the shadow of the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross reminds me I don't belong to myself. The cross reminds me that I was dead until he died for me. He saves me, not not so that I can do whatever I want, but so that I can follow him, to honor him for buying me at the price that he paid. So taken in that light, it's easy to see why Jesus says what he does in Matthew 7. This way of living is difficult. This road is narrow. It's tough to trust him and not trust you. It's tough to be selfless, not selfish. It's tough to do what he wants instead of what you want. 
And what I think makes this narrow way even more challenging is it seems like everybody else is going the other direction. You get that, right? They're going the other way. Have you ever stepped into a stream or a river and tried to swim upstream? You ever walked into a strong headwind? It's hard, isn't it? It's slow going. It's exhausting when you're going against the flow. And it's, it's much, much easier to simply give in and float right along with the current. And what even compounds this more is this happens even in the church. Notice what Jesus says just a few verses later, verse 21. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name, performed many miracles in your name, but I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. There are those who claim faith in Christ, but for them it's only lip service. They're just saying the right things. They aren't really in a relationship with Jesus. They don't really know God. They go to church. They say good things. They know the insider language. They say the right things, but they don't live the right way. They do good things. They do religious things. But those things aren't done out of a love relationship with their Savior. They're just church attenders. They just say what they say because that's what is expected of the people that they hang out with. And friends, those verses ought to scare you. Because this is a very real thing that very real people are going to experience. They will get to the gates of God's kingdom. They've said the right things. They've done some right things. And there on that day when it's too late, they will discover that Jesus has no idea who they are. So if your faith is nothing more than fire insurance or religious activity or even habitual church attendance, you need to reevaluate whether your faith is real, which is something the Bible tells us to do over and over again. 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. Test yourselves. Surely you know that Jesus Christ is among you. If not, you have failed the test of genuine faith. Hebrews 12, 15, look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. 2 Peter 1, verse 10. So dear brothers and sisters, work hard to prove that you really are among those God has called and chosen. Do these things and you will never fall away. Then God will give you a grand entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Evaluate. Examine. Test. In the Garden of Eden, there was one path to death and they chose it. Because of the cross of Jesus, there is one path to life, and you must choose it. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad, its gate is w- and its gate is wide for the many who choose that way, but the gateway to life is very narrow, and the road is difficult, and only a few ever find it. You know, I mentioned earlier that, that people call Christians arrogant, And they call them exclusive because they believe that what Jesus said is true, that there is only one way to eternal life. Arrogant, exclusive. Let me tell you why that's not the case. This is not arrogant at all because you are not the basis of your salvation. Your morality, your lifestyle is not the reason you are saved. The basis of your salvation is the person and work of Jesus Christ on your behalf. This is not arrogant at all. To say that you think you're good enough to work your way into a relationship with God, that is the arrogant view. Let me tell you why this is not exclusive. Because this offer of salvation isn't for an elect few of spiritually elite people. This offer of salvation goes to everyone. 
It, it is offered to everyone. It's offered to you right now from the Lord himself. That's not exclusive. That's the most inclusive thing in the world because everybody can get in on this if they want to be. Now, I started this sermon by telling you about an ancient Buddhist story. It sounds a lot like Luke 15, Jesus' parable of the prodigal son. Well, in the Buddhist story, the, the son comes home and the, the father does welcome him there. You know, he been off wasting dad's money, he comes to his senses and comes home. What, what a smart move. Dad welcomes him there. But this is where the similarities stop. Because in the Buddhist story, the father does welcome his son home, but before he lets him in the house, he forces him into slavery for 20 years until he could work off all of the mistakes he had made until he had paid the price, until you've done everything that I've told you to do, until you work your way back into my good graces, 20 years as a slave, only then can you be welcomed into my home as my son. Well, that's very different than Luke 15, isn't it? The son blew it. He made a lot of mistakes. He comes to his senses and he comes home. But dad sees him from a distance and runs to him, embraces him as a son, throws a party to celebrate this son who was lost but now is found, the son of mine who was dead but is alive again. They're not similar at all. I've told this before, but it's just too good not to tell it again. Uh, Ravi Zacharias tells the story of Dr. E. Stanley Jones, the famous missionary to India. E. Stanley Jones had been invited to speak about Christianity, and the governor of the state in, in, in India in which he was speaking got up and introduced E. Stanley Jones and said, after Dr. Jones has finished speaking, I will then get up and explain to you the parallels to Christianity in the Hindu writings. E. Stanley Jones spoke for an hour, and then the governor got up and dismissed the crowd without comment. Why? Because for an hour, E. Stanley Jones had talked about Jesus. There are no parallels to Jesus in the Hindu writings. There are no similarities to Jesus anywhere. Outside of Jesus, it all depends on you. But only in Jesus do we find the offer of eternal life, the forgiveness of sins given to us. This is called grace. And there is only one place to find grace. And that is in Jesus Christ alone. So the offer has gone. It's gone out to you. It goes out to everyone who hears. There is one way to life. And you must choose it. So the response is very simple. It's very clear. The, the Bible says that you need to believe that Jesus is the Son of God who died for your sins and rose from the dead. The Bible says for you to repent of sin and turn to Jesus. The Bible says for you to confess Jesus as Lord. The Bible says for you to unite with Jesus as you're immersed in the waters of baptism. The offer's gone out. You have to choose. Maybe today is your day. Let's pray. Father, when we hear these words, you can enter God's kingdom. It's overwhelming. That's good news. So we're not offended. We're not bothered by the fact there's only one way to get in. We're in awe of the fact that there's a way at all. Because we didn't deserve that. We didn't earn that. That is beyond us. But you made a way to get into your kingdom for those who want to get into your kingdom. There's one way to life, and we have to choose it. There are an infinite number of ways to death. Keep us from choosing those. So thank you for Jesus, for his work on our behalf, for grace that comes to us by his work. 
for those who have not placed their trust in you, for those who are church people, but they're not followers of Jesus, of whom Jesus spoke in Matthew 7, that they say the right things, but they're, it's not real. By your Spirit, may you open their eyes. May they turn to you and embrace the free offer of salvation because it's the only place to find it. And for the rest of us, we take the next few moments and we're reminded once again of the sacrifice of Jesus, the truth upon which we stand. So we take this little piece of bread, we take this cup of juice, and with them, we remember the sacrifice of Jesus on our part. Thank you for him. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. together now. I cast my mind on Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet. My Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone. The Messiah's did. And all alone. Now let us stand and praise the name of our Lord. Let's sing.
This is the part where we get up every week and again say thank you for your whoops for your continual continued faithfulness in giving uh, by your giving who we are as a church what we're able to do as a church uh, is simply because of the sustained faithful generosity of the people who call this church home so thank you very much for continuing to do that and uh, we remind you every week there's a number of ways for you to be able to give you can do that online broadwaycc.org slash giving you can set all that stuff up however you would like you can text any amount to 84321. Uh, or if you're here in the room, you can drop it in the metal buckets on the way out the doors. Thank you very much for continuing to do that. Now, before I pray and we uh, sing another song together to close things out, I want to take just a moment and uh, make an announcement to you that we are very excited about and invite you to pray about that with us. For the last number of months, the elders and I have been in a conversation about how do you move forward as a church after 2020? You know, what, what do you do to serve people well, to meet the needs of, of people, to serve in our community? What does it look like on the other side of this, and how do, how do you figure that out? And so you pray for wisdom for uh, the, the elders as we do that and move forward together. But part of that conversation uh, has included what does it look like for us to hire a new position on to our staff? You know, this church has always had uh, what we call number two. Uh, Greg had Casey, Marvin had Lloyd, on and on the list goes of those who, there was always a number two around. And a few years ago, uh, we attempted to hire a position at the time we called an executive minister. And almost from the very beginning, that position was not a good fit and it didn't work out like we had hoped. And it's been a couple of years since we've had that role around. So for the last 10 months, the elders and I have been talking about what does it look like for us to hire an associate minister here at Broadway a position that over the years this church has almost all the time had a role similar to that. Uh, the position will be a pastoral leader who helps with staff oversight, who helps with preaching and teaching, who helps with pastoral care, uh, a, a position that enables us to care for our people better, a position that enables us to be, quite honest with you, to start ministries that we've wanted to start for years but haven't been able to a position that helps us directly accomplish our mission of helping people find hope in Christ and a home in his church. So we've been praying about that and have decided it's time to move forward in that regard. It's been, again, a number of years since we've had a role like that. So we're just asking you to pray with us about that. We've got a, a short list of some guys that we've initiated conversations with already to, to talk to them about all of that and are they interested and would it be a good fit uh, all of those things. So be praying that the Lord would lead us to the right guy for that role, that uh, his will would be done, and that our church would be tremendously blessed by that new position here. Again, we are very excited about what that can uh, do uh, inside the church and through the church out into the world around us. Uh, so uh, it, it's a weird time, right, to make any sort of decisions. It's a weird time, we acknowledge, to, to make a decision even like this. 
but apparently the weirdness just isn't going to go away, is it? We're just going to have to embrace this, and we will not let COVID define this church. We will move forward as the Lord leads us to do so. So we're doing that boldly and courageously, and I invite you to pray with us about all of that. Uh, I'll be out in the lobby after the service is over. So if you have any questions about that position and all the things associated with it, I'll be happy to try to answer those questions for you. Be happy to talk to you. So we're excited. Pray about that with us. So let me pray, and then uh, we'll stand and sing one more song together. Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, the chance once again to gather as your people. It is a privilege to do so, to stand upon the foundational truth of your word and worship who, you for who you are and for what you've done. Thank you. It's been a blessing to us to be able to do that. So as we leave, may we go acknowledging who you are, acknowledging the work that you've done on our behalf and taking that good news into a world that is in desperate need of some good news. Thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together.
God bless you all. Have a great day, and may the peace of Christ be with you. God bless.